1 through 13 together. Verses 1 through 13 together. How many has ever read Lamentations? All right. Pretty good. I'd read it before, never preached from it though. Let me set this up for you. <clears throat> Jeremiah the prophet had been prophesying for, oh, for about nearly 50 years, 60 years, something like that, that God was going to use the Babylonians to, pub, to punish Judah for their sins and their idolatry. And they didn't believe him. And there was other prophets say, telling Judah that, no, that's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And so it's now happened. And so now Babylon has come in. They've destroyed the temple. They've killed most of the people in the city of Jerusalem, the ones that they didn't kill. Uh, the younger ones they've carried off to Babylon into captivity for the next 70 years. And what's left is just ruins of a city. And that's what the whole book of Lamentations is. It's Jeremiah observing the ruins of the city and the weeping and the mourning as a result of uh, the ruins of the city. So let's read uh, verses uh, 1, uh, I mean, uh, verse 1 through 13 here in chapter 2 together. Uh, this is the result of the Lord's punishment of Judah. How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with the cloud in his anger, and cast down from heaven unto the earth the beauty of Israel, and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord has swallowed up all the habitations of Judah, and has not pitied. He hath thrown down in his wrath the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought them down to the ground. He has polluted the kingdom and its princes. He has cut off in his fierce anger all the horn of Israel, he has drawn back his right hand from before the enemy, and he has burned against Judah like a flaming fire which devours round about. He has bent his bow like an enemy. He stood with his right hand as an adversary, and he slew all that were pleasant to the eye in the tabernacle of the daughters of Zion. He poured out his fury like fire. The Lord was an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her palaces. He has destroyed her strongholds. And he has increased in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. And he has violently take away, taken away his tabernacle like that of a garden. He has destroyed his places of assembly. The Lord has caused the solemn feast and the Sabbaths to be forgotten in Zion. And he hath despised in the indignation of his anger the king and the priest. The Lord has cast off his altar. He has abhorred his sanctuary. He has given up into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They have made a noise in the house of the Lord as in the day of a solemn feast. The Lord has purposed to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. He has stretched out a line. He has not withdrawn his hand from destroying. Therefore he made the ramparts and the wall to lament. They languish together. Her gates are sunk into the ground. He hath destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the nations. The law is no more. Her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. The elders of the daughters of Zion sit upon the ground and keep silence. And they cast up dust upon their heads. They have girded themselves uh, with sackcloth. The virgins of Jerusalem hang down their heads to the ground. Mine eyes do fail with tears. My heart is troubled. My liver is poured upon the earth for the de destruction of the daughter of my people. Because the children and the sucklings... Uh, swoon in the streets of the city. They say to their mothers, where is grain and where is wine? When they swoon like the wounded in the streets of the city, when their soul was poured out into, the mo into their mother's bosom. <clears throat> when the thing that shall, wh <clears throat> what thing shall I take to witness for thee? What thing shall I liken to, O daughter of Jerusalem? What shall I equal to thee that I may comfort thee, O virgin daughter of Zion? For they breach, thy breach is great like the sea who can heal thee. Father, I thank you for a great day, and I thank you for everyone that is here today to worship you, to praise you, and to hear from your word. I pray, Lord, that you'll give us great wisdom from your word today, wisdom for us to live our Christian lives. Help us to learn to be righteous people. Help us to live as holy people, uh, consecrated totally upon you, Jesus. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we love you, and we praise your holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Now, if I ask you this question, uh, let's say we, you came to talk to me and 
say a lot of things were not going well in your life. That happens, and uh, unfortunately or fortunately, you have pastors that are there to for you to talk with, or sometimes you maybe have friends that are there to talk with. But let's say that we talked for a while and there's a lot of things going on in your life. Maybe you lost your job, maybe you lost your family, maybe different things occurred. Uh, don't know what they might be. Uh, you just fill in the blanks. And what if I ask you this question? I say, you know, I say, well, do you think that something's going on in your life and do you think the Lord might be chastening you? How many of y'all would know what that means? Yeah, and see, that's the problem, see. Uh, in America especially, not so much overseas, but in America especially, uh, most of the sermons you hear are not going to deal with the chastening of the Lord. That's just not going to draw a lot of crowds. That's not going to influence a lot of people. You're just not going to hear that sermon very often. And yet, the chastening of the Lord is all over both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now remember... Jesus is God. Let's all say that. Jesus is God. So when, when you're talking about God in the Old Testament, you're talking about Jesus. When you're talking about Jesus in the New Testament, you're talking about God. They are one and the same. They are not different. There is not a different God in the Old Testament from Jesus in the New Testament. They're all one. Three in one. Jesus is God. So the things that occurred in the Old Testament have direct application to the children of God today, those people who are children of God, not by birth, by being Jewish, but, are, but have been grafted in to the olive tree by, by faith in, in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We are the children of God. Let's all say that. We are the children of God. So, what are we reading here? Well, we're studying through the Bible, every book of the Bible, just preaching one sermon from each book, as you know. That's why I'm preaching from Lamentations today. I didn't pick Lamentations. That's just the next book. Next week will be in Ezekiel, which is a really far out book. So why, why Lamentations? What is it there for? A lamentation is a picture of the Lord's chastening and how you can recover from that. See, when you have trouble in your life, <clears throat> when you have trouble in your life, uh, it can be for one of two reasons. Only, only two, really, to be honest with you. You can be like Job. Who's ever read the book of Job? See, Job, we've studied Job. Job didn't do anything wrong. And yet he had all kinds of trouble. See, sometimes you can be totally innocent. You can be totally, you know, prayed up. You can be living a righteous life. You can be a holy person. Uh, you can be doing everything right as a believer in Christ, and you can have trouble. Don't let anybody ever tell you that if you're living a perfect Christian life that you won't have any trouble because that's a lie straight from the pit of hell designed to weaken you as a believer. You're not going to have any strength as a believer in Jesus Christ if you think that when you do everything right, everything's going to go well because then when things don't go good and you're not doing anything wrong, you're going to say, hey, what's going on here? So you can just come under attack sometimes. God allows that. That's what God did with Job. He allowed Job to be attacked by Satan. And remember, when we're attacked, we're not attacked by God, but he allows the attack. You say, Brother Don, why does God allow the attack? You know, I have no idea. I'm a human being just like you are. I have no idea. That's God's end of the stick. But he always has a purpose for allowing the attack. And that's what happened to Job. Job did nothing wrong, and yet he was attacked by Satan by the permission will, permissive will of God. But then there's a second reason and the more likely reason that you can have trouble in your life. You can be spanked by God. Who's ever been spanked by God? Okay, that's chastening. Maybe I didn't say it right. Maybe I should have asked the question, who knows what I, when I say, are you being spanked by God, who knows? And then you would raise your hand, right? Because no one knows the big religious word chastening. You can be spanked by God. You know, I had a father that spanked the fire out of me. And I was so afraid of those spankings. And my mother said, hey, you're, when your dad gets home, you're going to get a spanking. I'm saying, I'm, my, my day was ruined, man. I mean, it was not like today. It was a real spanking. You know, and so, you know, I towed the line as best I could, although I really didn't tow the line that well. But anyhow, I'm just telling you that if you're going through a lot of problems sometime, if you look at your life, and God will show this to you. 
if you're a believer in Christ, God will show this to you through the Holy Spirit. And by the way, these two scenarios only apply to believers. Sinners, they're just out there. But we're the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? So this applies to the children of God. The two reasons are, is God allows it to happen in order to test us, to temper us, to build us up like he did Job, or we're living unrighteously as believers in Christ. We've abandoned our righteous living. We've abandoned our holiness. We're caught in a sin. Did you know that believers can be caught in sin? Did you know that? You can still be a believer in Jesus. You can be a born again believer in Jesus and you can be caught up in a sin. Did you know that? In fact, to be honest with you, think about this, don't say it out loud. But when you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin, nearly every day, there'll be some sort of repetitive sin in there that you're always asking to be forgiven of. I don't know what yours is, I know what mine is, but all of us got it, amen? So in order to live a righteous life, we have to deal with that sin on a daily basis, on a minute by minute basis, on a 24 seven basis. We have to deal with that sin in our life. We have to constantly get away from the sin and turn back to righteousness. Get away from the sin, turn back to righteousness. Have a bad conversation, you get mad, you, you lose your cool, Forgiveness, repentance, get away with the sin, get back to righteousness constantly. See something you shouldn't see, think about something you shouldn't think about, get rid of it, get rid of the sin, get back to righteousness. But sometimes, that's not what happens. And sometimes, that sin comes upon us, either in thought, by the way it can be thought, it doesn't have to be deed, it can be thought or deed. And we sort of get rid of it, we feel guilty about it, See, there's a, listen now, you're listening, say amen. There's a big difference in feeling guilty and repenting. Big difference in feeling guilty and repenting. Every believer in Christ, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, born again believer in Christ, say amen. Then when you commit sin, you're going to feel guilty. If you don't feel guilty when you commit sin, you're not saved. But if you're saved, when you commit sin, you're going to know about it. The Holy Spirit's going to speak it to you. You're going to know you just committed sin. And you're going to feel guilty about it. But that is not the same as repentance. You see, God is faithful. It says 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's absolutely true. But then he expects us to repent. Not to feel guilty, but to repent. He cleanses us of that guiltiness. But he expects us, what did Jesus say to the woman caught in adultery? Your sins are forgiven, go and sin no more. If she would have immediately re uh, re returned to adultery, then that's not repentance. She didn't accept the forgiveness that Christ gave her. And what it would, would have done, it would build up in your system, builds up in your system, builds up in your system, and creates a believer in Christ living an unrighteous life. Listen, listen to me now. There are believers that sit in churches every single Sunday that are believers in Jesus Christ. They're born again believers in Christ. They're bound for eternity. They're bound for heaven with God the Father that are not living righteous lives. They are not being holy. Peter says, uh, you know, we are to live holiness, be holy because he is holy. But they're not living holy lives. And they come and sit in the sanctuaries and you know, I, you know I, I come from a small town area and the last church I pastored, I knew more about the people there than I do here because we have a lot of visitors that come in. And I would see people that I knew were not living uh, righteous lives come every single Sunday, sing all the hymns with all the rest of us and they weren't living righteous lives. No chance. But yet they came to church, they were sitting in church. So coming to church, sitting in church, sitting in the pew, not going to cause you to live a righteous life. You, you live a righteous life because your relationship with Christ that is guilt-free because not only have you accepted his forgiveness, not only have you accepted his cleansing, but you have turned from that sin. Will you sin again? You betcha. What do you do? You get it out of your system and you repent and turn away from it as fast as you can. But see, what had happened here is Israel for about 150 years, or Judah actually, Israel if you remember, you got the northern tribes, Israel, consisted of ten tribes. You got the southern tribe, Judah, consisted of two tribes. Well, Israel was already gone. Assyria had already wiped them out in 750 B.C. But Judah stuck around for an extra 170 years. 
until they got wiped out by the Babylonians because God allowed it to occur. Well, during that 170 years, they turned totally to idolatry. You see, a lot of believers don't think about that. But if you read over there in the New Testament, it says flee youthful, youthful lust. It says flee from fornication. It also says flee from idolatry. And see, for a lot of believers, I don't know about you, but I've committed the sin of idolatry a lot. What is the sin of idolatry? When something in your life becomes more important to you than your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus demands to be number one. And so when we put anything else in our life more important to us, allow something in our life to become more important to us than Jesus, we have committed a sin. And we're living in a state of idolatry. That might be the most important reoccurring sin among believers in the United States of America over maybe any other sin perhaps most people think that sin is all wrapped somewhere around sexual lust and this and that and the other and of course that could, that's very possible too but idolatry might be the most reoccurring sin that believers have and maybe they don't even realize what a sin it is because Jesus wants to be number one and if Jesus is not number one in our lives then we're committing the sin of idolatry because he demands to be. And here's what happens. Here's what happened to the Jews. They started sacrificing the idols. They went the full, the full whammy. You know, they, they started setting up the uh, uh, statues to Moloch. They started set, setting up statues to uh, Baal down in the Valley of Hinnom that we studied about when we studied the book of Jeremiah. They started sacrificing their children on these altars, uh, burning them in the fire. And their idol worship of Moloch and their idol worship of Baal, they did all that. Well, we've not ever done that. Who would sacrifice their families because they're worshiping an idol? But you see, that occurs all the time. There's people, there's men and women that fought moms and dads and, that are believers in Jesus Christ that they sacrifice their family in certain ways. They don't offer them on sacrifice like that. But they sacrifice their families all the time because something becomes more important to them than their families. Something becomes more important to them to, than, than Jesus. And all of a sudden, their entire life is wrapped around that idol. And consequently, their family suffers and their relationship with Jesus suffers and their life is filled with that sin. You say, Brother Don, this is just not a very happy sermon. Well, Lamentations, does that sound like a happy book? I mean, really, does Lamentations sound like a happy book? I don't think so. But you see, what good am I as a preacher if I don't tell you the truth? So what's happened here is after 170 years of Isaiah and Jeremiah preaching to them, they had rejected the truth and they'd gone after a lie. And see, I'm just afraid that what I see in the church today, I don't see many people warning believers um, that if they don't live the right kind of life and if they don't live a righteous life that they can be spanked by God. I just don't see a lot of that kind of preaching going on. And yet, how many of, how many of you in here have ever had any kind of problem? Some of you are all so young you've never had any serious problems. But how many of you have ever had any kind of problem whatsoever that was just too big for you and you fell on your knees and prayed to God to solve that problem? Just, just give it, give it, okay. All right. So everybody's had some problems. So when you, you are going to have problems, Jesus says you are going to have problems, you are going to experience trials, those things are going to come. So what good, does it, what good do I do you if I don't prepare you to face those trials? You've got to know how to face the trials. Yeah, everybody can be a good believer in the good times, but what about the bad times? What about the times when everything turns south? That's when you've got to decide, am I committing a sin? Is that why it's turned south? Or am I being built up by God and I just got to hang in there like Job did? That's what you've got to decide. So what's happened to Israel? God is spanking them severely. It was so bad that the when the Babylonians uh, laid siege, and they came first in 605 B.C., and they came back in 586. When they laid siege to the city, you know, people in the city were uh, committing cannibalism. They were eating their children. Uh, and uh, 
And the children, with the, if the parents would die, they were eating their parents uh, for food because the siege around the city was so intense. It was a horrible situation. That's what we're talking about all the dead bodies in the street. The dead bodies were laying all over the street. The temple was gone, etc. Because the Lord was spanking them severely because they were his children. He didn't care about the Babylonians. He didn't care about the Assyrians. He used the Assyrians to defeat Israel and to chastise them, chasing them. He used the Babylonians to chasten Israel. But that was only, his only concern was the Babylonians. His children was the nation Israel. Understand that, that what we're talking about today, we're not talking about sinners outside the church. We're not talking about people that are of a different faith, like, you know, they're Muslim or, or whatever they are. We're not talking about that. We're talking about born-again believers in Jesus Christ can, are going to be, not can be, are going to be chastened by the Lord at some point in time. Why were they being chastened? It says here in verse 14, Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee, and they have not uncovered thine iniquity to turn away thy captivity, but have seen for thee fable burdens, uh, false burdens, and cause, causes for banishment. In other words, their preachers weren't telling them the truth. Jeremiah was, but the other prophets were telling them, it'll be okay. The Lord loves us. Jesus loves us. Jesus loves me. Yes, he does. He's not going to do anything bad to me. He's not going to let me suffer. And everything's going to be turn out okay. That's what they were telling the people. They were saying, okay, I know this, this idol worship is a bad thing. It'll be okay. The Lord has promised we're his children. We're his anointed. Everything will be okay. Jeremiah was saying, hey, everything is not going to be okay. And I will say this to Christians. If you're not living a righteous life, everything is not going to be okay. Hey, listen. I'm the most hard-headed guy in this room probably. Uh, I'm one of those guys that I've learned everything from mistakes. Who, who in here will confess that you've learned most of your best lessons from all your mistakes other than me? Okay. That's me. So I've been chastened a lot. So I recognize it immediately when it occurs. And plus, when you really begin to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit begins to say, hey, you really messed up this time. I'm going to prove it to you. And then it happens and you say, oh boy, oh boy. So anyhow, they had false prophets that didn't tell them the truth. And, uh, and when that occurred and the, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed, uh, here in verse 15 to 16, what happened was is the nations that lived around the area, like today would be Jordan, at that time it was Edom, and different countries, the, the northern tribe countries that were now what we would know in the New Testament days as the Samaritans, they all began to make fun of the Jewish people because, see, the Jewish people claimed that they worshiped the one true God and that the one true God protected them from all kinds of problems and so that they didn't have the kind of problems as the nations because the one true God protected them. And now here they are, their city is destroyed, their lives are destroyed, their livelihoods are destroyed, they've been carried into captivity, and now the people of the world are making fun of them. Listen, in our nation, Christianity is being picked on a lot. Judaism is being picked on a lot. But you let bad things start happening to believers, and we will really be picked on a lot. We will be ridiculed. We will be made fun of. And so that's what was happening there. Then you move down to uh, verse 17. And this describes what the Lord was doing. He describes, he says, The Lord has done that which he had purposed. You might want to circle that word. He has fulfilled his word that he had commanded in the days of old for 170 years. He has thrown down and he has not pitied and he has caused thine enemy to rejoice over thee. He has set up the horn of thine adversaries. It means he has exalted their horn over the horn of Israel. But notice the Lord had a purpose. If you're not doing anything wrong and the Lord allows Satan to attack you, he's got a purpose. What is that purpose, Brother Don? Don't know. That's the Lord's end of the stick. But he's got a purpose. Just trust in the Lord. If you are sinning and the Lord begins to chasten you, spank you, he has a purpose. What is his purpose? Listen now. You've got to get this. What is his purpose? To restore you. To restore you to right living. 
to restore you to righteousness, to restore you in your relationship with Jesus. That's why the Lord spanks us. He didn't spank us to hurt us. He didn't spank us to kill us. He didn't spank us to destroy us. He spanks us to restores us, restore us. If you've got a child, some of you have child, children, some of you don't, some of you are thinking about having children. Before I had any children, I was going to write a book about raising children. And then I had four children, and I wouldn't even think about writing a book about how to raise children, especially not the first child, because the first child, who in here is the first child? Yeah, boy, I'm telling you, first children, you know, you make a lot of mistakes with the first child, you know. My oldest son, Don, picks on me all the time because he thinks I'm too easy on my daughter, Elizabeth, who was the fourth child. You know what, I pretty, I pretty much am easier on her than I was the rest of the children because here's another thing you learn as you get older. When you go to the nursing home, the only person that ever comes to visit you are the daughters, not the, hus not the sons. The daughters come and feed you the applesauce in the nursing home, okay? But not the sons. They don't come and do that. So you've got to take care of your daughters as you get older. But anyhow, nobody... But when you've got a child, when you're raising a child, if you don't discipline that child to live the right way, Suppose a kid comes in and says, hey, you got any homework tonight? Yeah, but I just don't think I'll do it. Well, you know, that's okay. It's okay. You don't have to do that, you know. You really want to wear that to school today? Yeah, this is what I want to wear to school today. Yeah, it's okay. Nobody cares. Go ahead and go to school like that. Man, you're going to have a messed up kid. There's no telling what that kid's going to get into. Hey, there's no telling what your kid's going to get into even if you do all the right things. Because if you do everything right and you're a perfect parent, your kids are... How many of you guys had good parents? How many of you guys made a lot of mistakes even though you had good parents? Yeah, see, it, it's no guarantees, but you better do the best job you can. And you're not doing your kid any favors whatsoever if you do not discipline them when they make mistakes. Maybe the thing today, maybe you don't do corporal punishment. I've told you before that... What I did with my kids, I made them hold books like this, and that just, that's a killer. You know, that, that is worse. They would say, spank us, you know, do whatever you want to do, but don't make us hold the books. And they'd, get the books, you know, and say, yeah. So they'd go get the books. You're not doing your child any favors. And when you do punish your child, hopefully you're going to do it because you have a purpose in mind. You want them to learn a lesson. If they don't do their homework, then you do something positive to make them to get the point across that they have to do their homework or you, you know, you discipline them in different ways. You have to do that or you have a messed up child. So what the Lord is doing here is he's taking care of his child, Judah. It's his child. It's his people. Yeah, is he being hard on them? You betcha. And he's calling them to repentance. Verse 18. Their hearts cried unto the Lord, uh, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears run down like a river. Day and night, give thyself no rest. Let not the apple of thine eye cease. Arise, cry out in the night, in the beginning of the watches. Pour out at your heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up your hands toward him for the life of thy young children who faint for hunger in the top of every street. And so the Lord is chasing them. His purpose is, is to restore his relationship with the children of Israel. And he is doing the best he can do to cause them to repent. If you punish your child, your purpose is, is to get them to repent of what they were doing and to get on the right path. And that's what God is doing to Israel right here. Now, let me ask you a question. I saw some of you when I began to speak about this that kind of, kind of got the idea as you were wondering, well, how can we apply this to our Christian lives. Is there any way to apply this to our Christian lives? Well, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And who here has ever partaken of the Lord's Supper service? Anybody? Okay, cool. Did the preacher read some scripture from the Bible? Sure. 99 and 9 tenths percent of the time when the pastor uses scripture to conduct the Lord's Supper service or the Eucharist or communion, uh, he's going to use 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He might even preach a little mini-sermon for two or three minutes, and he might refer to verses 27 through 32, and that's what we're going to look at. Now, here's the application today. The application today is that 
Israel had failed to respond to Jeremiah and Isaiah's preaching. So consequently, God had to punish them to the point so severely that they would repent and turn back to him. All right, so every time before we take the Lord's Supper service, now as Southern Baptists, we do it about once a quarter. Some folks do it every week. However you do it, that's okay. There's really no fast rule in the Bible on how often you do it. Wherefore, whosoever, verse 27, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So in other words, before you take the Lord's Supper service, you're supposed to be prayed up. You're supposed to be confessed up. You're supposed to make sure that any sin that is in your life that to the best of your ability, you've repented of that sin and turned away from that sin and got it out of your life before you take the Lord's Supper service or you take the Lord's Supper service unworthily. Now, that's the easy part. Look at 28. But let a man examine himself. And say, that's what this sermon is all about today. The sermon today is all about each of us examining ourselves. So let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of this bread and drink of this cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now watch verse 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. You know what that's saying? That's saying that people that took the Lord's Supper service unworthily because they didn't deal with the sin in their life <coughs> before they took of the, of the supper, they're suffering. They're being chastened. They're being spanked. They're weak and they're sickly. And some of them have slept, which meant they've died. <coughs> Listen. The Lord wants believers to live righteous, holy lives. If he has to spank us to get us there, he will. But what if when he spanks us over and over and over again, we don't get there? There's evidence right here that he just takes us out. He allows us to go on. <laughs> and there'll be a price to pay. We'll make it to heaven. We'll be in heaven with Jesus and God the Father, but there'll be a price to pay <coughs> because then we have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive those things done in our body, whether they be good or bad. Even as believers, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For if we would judge ourselves, and there's the key, you want to stay out of trouble, you don't want to get spanked by God, judge yourself, just as God would judge you. The Holy Spirit is helping you with that. The Holy Spirit convicts you when you sin. You have the Holy Spirit as your comforter, as the one that's come alongside to let you know. And God knows exactly what you've done. And the Holy Spirit lets you know that God knows. And the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin. Just deal with it. That's what it means to judge yourself. If we would judge ourselves, then we won't be judged by God. But when we are judged, we are chastened. There's that word again. Chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. God does not want his children, his believers, Christians. He does not want us living like the world. He expects us to live holy, righteous lives. And if we don't, he knows how to take care of his kids. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 12 and we're done for the day. Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> Now this is really critical. This sermon today primarily has been for believers, but I suspect that most of the people in the room today probably are believers. So this sermon is for believers. People that are not believers in Jesus Christ, they only need to hear one sermon, that they're sinners and that Jesus died for their sin and they can be saved by believing in Jesus Christ as their Lord and accepting Him as their Lord and by having faith that God raised Jesus from the dead. That's the only sermon that sinners need to hear, but believers, we need to know how to survive in this world, amen? And one of the things that determine how we survive in this world is how we deal with our sin. And so we have to be prepared to deal with our sin. But look here at Hebrews chapter 12. This should encourage you. It's been kind of a, maybe a negative uh, topic in the sermon. It hasn't been a negative sermon, but a negative topic in the sermon that's designed to help. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. For consider him, meaning Jesus, that endured 
such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You know, Jesus was perfect. That's what, that, what, that's what made him the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He never committed any sin. And yet, he loves each one of us who are sinners. So consider that contradiction. Jesus loves us even though we are sinners. Even now that we're saved, we still sin because we've got that sin nature in us. But Jesus still loves us. He never ceases to love us. You have not resisted sin being under blood, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto sons. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and he scourges every son whom he receives. So you see, if someone's not a believer in Jesus Christ, God doesn't chasten them. God doesn't scourge them. Remember, we live under this, this period of time that we're in right now is this big umbrella of grace. God doesn't bring instant judgment upon sinners. He's given them a chance to turn to Christ. Now, believers, that's a different story. We've already turned to Christ. And so when we get chased into the Lord, it's because we're already the adopted sons of God. So God only chastens sons, well, and daughters, if you want to put that in there. God only chastens his children. He chastens us, and it says he actually scourges us. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, of which all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh who corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be subject in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us their own, for their own pleasure, but he for our profit. See, here's what God's saying. God is saying, hey, yes, I'm chastening you. Yes, you're in pain right now. Yes, you're under a trial right now. Yes, and you're do I'm doing this to you because you were a sinner. You were living an unrighteous life. But I'm doing this to profit you. How can it profit us as believers? But he did it for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. God wants us to live holy lives. Now, no chastening for the present time seems to be joyous, but grievous nevertheless. Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them who are exercised by it. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. So what is uh, Paul saying to us here in the book of Hebrews? He's saying, hey, when God chastens you, rejoice. Because that means you're a son of God. When you go through all those that pain, even you're, though you're in pain, rejoice. Because God is molding you into something better. Everything that's happening to you is for our profit. See, I guess the axiom is true, or the premise is true, that and no matter what happens in our life, uh, Jesus loves us unconditionally. That is absolutely true. But see, some people think that when we accept that premise that Jesus loves us no matter what, some people think that means that, that, means that only good things will happen to us, and that's just not true. It, what it means is, is whether good things are happening to us or we're in trials or tribulations, that Jesus loves us unconditionally. And if he's allowing us to be tested by the devil or if he's allowing the Satan, using Satan to spank us, whatever he's doing, he's doing it for our profit. Job lost everything except his wife. And there was days he wished he'd lost her, I think, perhaps, you know. But what happened in the end? He ended up with more than he started with. Because God used that period of time to write a book that we would understand. He used that period of time in Job's life to let Job understand that God is God and he's not. 
let Job understand that we're never going to understand God's purposes or God's designs or God's will. And Job, as a result, profited from that experience by the same thing in chastening. Look at what happened to David. David was chastened because of his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. That child of that first adulterous relationship, that child died. And so David was chastened by the Lord. The Lord could have killed him, but he didn't. He had other purposes for David to live on and survive. That he was, you know, David did suffer some after that, but the Lord had purposes for David. And he had, and he profited David through the through the through the suffering. David ended his life as a godly man. You see, God wants us to finish our walk as a believer in Christ on the upswing, not in a tailspin. Some people start off real strong as believers in Christ, and they are what I call thirty-day wonders. Uh, I respect it when somebody accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior for thirty days. That's really cool. But I tell you, the guys I really respect, those guys that have been in the struggle, been in the walk <clears throat> for 30 years instead of 30, instead of 30 days. Because, see, the Christian life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that the way we're supposed to finish our race is that when we get to the, we can see the finish line coming up, that's when we're to kick it into gear. And to get our second win, and we're to break the tape before everybody else does. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, one of my favorite passages. So how about you? <clears throat> I don't know where you are right now. Is everything rolling along pretty smooth based on our prayer request? It sure sounds like everything's rolling along pretty smooth. How is your relationship with Jesus? Are you pretty close to Christ? Is there something in your life that's keeping you from being close to Christ? Is Christ number one in your life? These are things that we should contend with in our minds and in our prayer time and our meditation time with, with Jesus. These are things that we should talk about in our minds with Christ every day. Is my life pleasing to Jesus? Is Jesus number one in my life? Is there anything trying to edge in there that's more important? See, as parents, if you're not careful, sometimes your children become more important to you than your relationship to Jesus just a natural thing to occur. Jesus wants to be number one. Father, I thank you for the day. I thank you for everybody that attended here today, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit right now is taking the words that were said and, and preaching all individual sermons to every mind that is here. I pray, Lord, that you're using your word from Lamentation and from 1 Corinthians and from Hebrews. I pray that you're using your word to transform each one of us to holy, righteous people. Forgive us, Lord, for all of our sins because they are many, they are frequent. Forgive us, Lord, of that and help us to live lives in the light, realizing that we are people with a sin nature that we're still stuck with and that we have to work very hard to avoid that sin nature taking over our lives. Lord Jesus, I pray today that you would bless everybody in the house. I pray today that you would reveal to every person in the house before they walk out of here today through your Holy Spirit where they are in their relationship to you. We love you, Jesus, and we praise your holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Let's